Welcome, and thank you for being with, here with us today. I'm Jamila Aldejani, and I'm the chair of the Women in Business Committee at the American Chamber of Commerce in Saudi Arabia. And I'm delighted to be moderating this event to discuss the impact of societal norms on women's economic empowerment in Saudi Arabia. This event is the third of the WIN, Women Innovators, Fellowship Workshops, which the Atlantic Council leads in cooperation with Georgetown University's McDonald School of Business, thanks to the generous support of the U.S. Embassy Riyadh, PepsiCo, UPS, and the in-person event partnership with the American Chamber of Commerce, Saudi Arabia. The WIN Fellowship is enabling more than 30 Saudi women entrepreneurs to build leadership and executive capacity to scale their startups to new heights. For decades, social and cultural restraints barred women in Saudi Arabia from full freedom of movement, certain aspects of financial independence, and the ability to even work in certain sectors. These rapid changes introduced by the Saudi government in recent years have opened new avenues for women in terms of employment, entrepreneurship, and business leadership. In 2013, Saudi Arabia allowed women to, pr to practice law and argue their cases in Saudi courtrooms, a triumph that came after years of being prohibited from appearing in court. The kingdom just recently announced 700 new licenses for women lawyers, bringing the total to over 2,000, which is a rapid shift from just a decade ago. In 2015, the Saudi Ministry of Labor required employers to grant at least 10 weeks of fully paid maternity leave to female employees. The law also ensures women can take maternity leave for four weeks prior to their due date. This change has encouraged more women to work in the public and private sector. In 2018, Saudi Arabia prohibited wage discrimination of women in the private sector. And in 2019, Saudi women were granted the right to apply for passports, travel abroad, register as co-head of a household, and be eligible for the guardianship of minors. This significant change impacted women's ability to work without getting a male's relative's permission. However, Saudi women, like women all over the world, still face a gender gap that can prevent them from achieving their full potential. Stereotypes about gender roles, pay disparity, traditional work schedules, lack of affordable, affordable childcare, and insufficient maternity leave are just some of the issues that many women face globally. Our esteemed speakers today will help us explore how the recent changes in Saudi Arabia are impacting society and culture, and in particular, women's ability to work, start businesses, and lead companies. But before I turn the floor over to them, let me introduce them to you all. We have Bara Al Khatib, who's the head of talent acquisition at Foodix, a Saudi startup that is the leading restaurant tech company in the Middle East. Bara leads a team of over 10 full time and freelance recruitment con consults and agencies. She's also worked as the director of solutions for TTM Associates, a UK based consultancy firm. Dr. Hana Al Mu'aybit is a research fellow at King Faisal's Center for Research and Islamic Studies where she advises public, private, and nonprofit entities on Gulf youth and women through their research company, Prolego Mina. She's an expert on education and work, sustainability, and gender policy in the GCC and Mina. Hana is also the Vice President of Research at the Arab Institute for Women's Empowerment, NUSF, and is on the board of Johara Global, a social enterprise dedicated to accelerating female leadership across the GCC and promoting cross-cultural integration across the Arabian Gulf and globally. She also sits on the board and CSR committees of private sector entities within Saudi Arabia. We also have May El Mizani, the founder and CEO of the Arab Institute for Women's Empowerment, MILSF, a premier women's executive leadership institute and social enterprise founded to equip Saudi and Arab women with capacity building programs focused on leadership training, researching, and connecting. And Mazzani has had a 30-year career at Aramco, where she held various leadership positions in the field of regulatory and public affairs, corporate brand management, public relations, and corporate affairs. She's received the Arabian Business Woman of the Year ASA Excellence Award for her efforts in advancing women's empowerment through eight different engagement and leadership programs. And finally, we have Zina Janabi. This is a diversity and inclusion lead for PwC Middle East, where she is actively involved in many people development initiatives, including training, coaching, and mentorship internally and externally. Janabi is an active steering committee member of the Dubai Business Women Council Mentorship Program 
and an active mentor with leading mentorship organizations globally. Jen Nabi is a certified mental health first aider and supports in transforming the mental health dialogue across the region to drive a cultural transformation in support of psychological safety and to enable more inclusive mindset and behaviors. So whether you're joining this discussion from our in-person location at PepsiCo's offices in Riyadh or virtually via Zoom, we hope you'll submit your questions for the panelists using the Q&A feature on the Zoom. And for those in Riyadh, you can ask your questions directly on camera. Just raise your hand and Raghad from the PepsiCo team will help you get to the camera and we'll get to as many audience questions as possible today. So with that, let's get started with a few questions to our panelists. So May, if we can start with you. So I'd like to ask, what is one social cultural change that you've witnessed in the last five years that's had the most impact on women's ability to work uh, or start a business or to raise to a leadership role at work? Um, I'm delighted to be here, Demila. Thank you very much. In my view and beyond all the countless legislations and laws that have been passed over the last five years, I'd say that women's driving has had the greatest tectonic shift uh, for them, their families, and the society at large. Uh, for example, families who had drivers uh, before had let them go and the money was used to buy a small car and become more mobile and they became more independent. And as women have uh, become more mobile, they were able to take on more jobs that they had declined before because they couldn't reach that job. And, and through that, uh, that issue they they took on more jobs and were able to gain more experience and moved up that leadership ladder and with those who didn't find themselves in that leadership ladder or it wasn't uh, what they were looking for decided to venture into small startups and create their own business so all in all i would say besides this contributing heavily into the economy over the past five years women's participation in the workforce increased from 17% to 36%. And women SMEs that used to be less than 20% is now uh, 45%. But the most surprising thing to us Saudis and the world watching us is that this whole thing shifted so seamlessly. Yeah. I can see that. I think it's, you know, I think looking from the outside in, sometimes it can seem kind of a bit of a shock factor and people don't really know how quickly things have evolved and, you know, it's, it's, but it has been a smooth transition and, and it's interesting how you can bring up, you know, women's driving. And I think, you know, when you think about mobility, that is, it's critical um, to be able to work. And so I, yes, I can see how that, you know, played a, a major factor. Uh, thank you, May. Um, if we turn over to Zina for a moment, um, Zima, I, I'd like to ask you, you know, with the rapid shift you know, that, that we talked about to suddenly having men and women working side by side together, as well as more women taking on leadership roles at work, can you share what you're seeing and hearing in terms of attitudes about this change? Uh, have you seen some temp companies take steps that have helped ease that transition? Um, so as to say seamlessly as May has addressed, you know, in terms of a social component as well? Thanks, Jamila. Delighted to be here. Um, well, organizations are taking good steps to ensure that they embed equitable workplace uh, policies and practices that help uh, women overcome barriers uh, that they face in their careers. For example, running sponsorship programs, mentorship programs, and, uh, and other programs that provide tailored support and equal access to opportunities. However, for the true transformation change, uh, we need to intervene at our organization level and individual level as well. Attitudes towards women in the workplace and their careers need to shift culturally. Um, although this takes time, but as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, Saudi emphasis on women's uh, empowerment uh, vision 2030 has fast tracked this shift, and we are all seeing really huge strides, uh, strides in this regards. Um, one thing that I would like to mention uh, in terms of what I'm seeing, honestly, I'm seeing organizations are taking dual approach. 
um, they are creating a culture where women can thrive and they and provide uh, programs for them to to and policies in place to help them move to the next level. So it's a dual approach. That's that's what I'm seeing on the ground. Um, however, on a personal level, we all have a role to play, uh, and by being allies to each other, it is important that we are all aware of how women or any minority, to be honest, experience work and the barriers that they face, and we do our best to help them. Thank you, Zina. Yeah, I like how you mentioned that dual approach. And it's interesting, especially when you look at things from an organizational perspective and an independent individ individual perspective. And um, and I think, you know, they kind of have to work kind of hand in hand um, to be able to then support women, you know, to achieve their full potential. Um, and with that, I'd like to actually turn over to, to Hannah uh, and just talk a little bit about the double burden, right? Because that, of course, is something that does uh, impact women, you know, in organizations as well. Um, so, Hannah, in many societies, women face the double work burden of work uh, and childcare or family obligations. Sometimes are expected to prioritize motherhood over work. How do you see that this dynamic is occurring or changing in Saudi? Thank you so much, Jamila, and it is a pleasure to be here. Um, this is a really important question for me as a mother as well, uh, who's worked you know, throughout my children's lives. So yes, there's definitely um, that burden that we do face. And I think it's really important just kind of as a, a note, not to essentialize our experiences as Saudi women to be so different from women in other parts of the world. Of course, we're facing many of the challenges that women in other parts of the world are facing as well. What's important is that we contextualize it and really understand what the nuances are in Saudi to really kind of understand, you know, what it looks like here, but not that it's necessarily different or completely removed from the experiences, kind of that collective experience of women globally. I think COVID-19 really highlighted that dual burden. Many women had to fulfill childcare duties in a really new way. And so much of this was left to the mothers uh, to figure out, you know, how am I going to do this? How am I going to kind of balance between if I do work, um, making sure that my children are also logged in and online for their school. Um, so I think that, you know, it, it it was maybe something that people didn't necessarily talk about as much, but COVID really brought it to the surface. Um, there has definitely been support for women in the workplace for a very long time, as long as it met certain criteria. And I mean, it's that criteria that's shifting. But you've seen support for women, even if she's leaving the home in the past, especially kind of in like these, the cluster of healthcare or education. And as it expands and moves outside of that, maybe there's more judgment when women are expanding into areas that people are less kind of familiar uh, seeing women in. So I think for many, having children still does mean exiting the workplace and leaving, unfortunately. But I do think that we're seeing now more workarounds and people trying to understand kind of how to make sure that job as a mother still gets done while other work outside the home gets done too. And I think a lot of women in our society, many, not all, are fortunate to have access, for instance, to domestic help at home. Um, the women that don't have that luxury maybe are now more uh, able to go work because there are government programs in place like Wusul and Qara, which are programs that are in place to support childcare as well as transportation. But I think the idea is you need to find a balance. Um, and so it's kind of maybe working less hours, working from home, delaying work until your children uh, children are in full-time school. Um, but I think, you know, for some in our society, you have grandparents that are maybe readily available. But as people start to move for work, which we're seeing more, that might not be available. So I do think there's two things in our society that make it a little bit more difficult when you're removed from that extended support. We don't really have a culture of babysitters or nannies. So we have domestic laborers, domestic help, for instance, however you want to call it, that might not have skills. So what can we do to make sure that finding quality childcare uh, is available? Is there training that we can do? Is there a culture that we can cultivate of people actually, you know, being career nannies? Potentially, it's a career track that could work. Um, so yeah, I do think that many workplaces, like Zena mentioned, are moving into being more women friendly. Um, but I think, you know, the guilt will always be there for all women. And maybe finding a mentor who is a woman uh, that's, that has experienced this and understanding that the guilt is, 
is reconcilable is okay. I think the most important thing that all women who work will tell you is it's the quality of time that you spend with your children, not necessarily necessarily the quantity. And I think we can find a balance. Yeah, that's very powerful. And I, and I think, you know, just focusing in on that balance component, I think that is critical and it's essential. And, and you, know, you talked about kind of the different facets of especially child care uh, or family care, and, you know, whether it's having a nanny or housekeeper or, um, or it be family. And, and in Saudi culture, family plays a significant role within the household. Do you think that um, the role of extended family is a way that can help navigate that challenge. How do you see kind of that extended family dynamic uh, within Saudi society playing a role? I think it's available to many, but not to all, as we are moving around the country to pursue work. And so I think that that's, that's creating an extra challenge, especially because we don't have that other culture of having childcare, like professional childcare available. So for sure, it's one of the things that makes our culture incredibly important or beneficial to women is having that extended network. But I think women are going to need to start creating different types of relationships with their friends as well, and also finding other types of support networks. And we need to think as women, maybe we can create better childcare facilities for other women as well. Yeah, that's uh, that's very well said. It's true, and I think you know it's with that with that shift of moving, um, relocation. I think that just does poses. Uh, that definitely poses more risks, right? And and just to take that kind of risk factor a bit further and focus in a little bit on entrepreneurship. So when pursuing entrepreneurship, um, you know, that is something that is more risky and not as conventional and sometimes frowned upon by families and communities that favor jobs that are more dependable. Right. So in the beginning, um, you know, and if the venture fails, it can be less prestigious to try and start your own company. And people may prefer to avoid the negative feedback. Um, from the family, friends, or the community as a whole. Um, are you noticing changes in attitudes about entrepreneurship more specifically, and, and especially women entrepreneurs in Saudi, especially given Vision 2030's focus on expanding the private sector? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think, for one, risk is still the kind of biggest barrier to going into um, an entrepreneurial venture. 70% of people even considering starting a business um, don't because they fear that that might fail, right? So primarily it's you're, you're working hard to gain that family support. And if you're going to lose out, you're going to lose on all of that other support that they might give you as well. However, the flip side of that is according to the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, um, entrepreneurship rose from 13.7 to 22.4% between 2016 and 2020 and women have a slight overall lead over men in being the ones to start these new companies especially in tech so there's a lot happening in that space and i think that um, despite that fear of starting your own company seeing other women succeed is really important for many women and i think there's more and more examples of that especially i think it was in 2021 there were 140,000 new commercial licenses to women which was a 112 percent increase from 2015. So over the six years, I, there's more women as examples, more men, more women that are potential mentors and more kind of role models for other women. So, yes, the risk is scary, but there's a lot that's changing and you have a very rapidly kind of dynamic um, space where this is happening that I think there's a lot of promise for that to, to kind of continue to move in that positive direction. Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned it. I mean, risk is there, right? And there's a challenge in addressing those risks and, and what people are willing to kind of take. But, you know, you mentioned a good point in terms of having those role models and examples to look up to. And, and with that, I'd like to actually turn over to Barat for a moment um, and just ask a bit more about the challenges that you, Barat, see um, that women in Saudi are facing when it comes to starting up businesses or senior or reaching senior leadership positions within companies. What are your thoughts on that, Barat? Amazing. Uh, thank you for the question and thank you for, for having me as part of this exciting discussion. I have to start by, by building on a point that has been mentioned by one of the ladies already in the conversation, which is the fact that I don't think that what women face in terms of challenges in KSA is far different from what women are facing in generally globally. We still, as, as females, face to a big extent the same challenges and same uh, um, uh, obstacles as we are uh, aiming to become more uh, presented in leadership roles or to, to have our own businesses running. Um, and 
I, I'd like to start actually by, by stating that there is the obvious of the stereotype that, that is uh, uh, associated with women in leadership. Um, in fact, um, a lot of studies suggest that when uh, companies are actually considering to promote uh, people from within, the, from within the company for leadership positions, women get um, less, uh, or at least uh, 14 to 15 percent less opportunities than males in being considered in leadership roles. And that is falls under the subconscious stereotype that is built around how women perform in leadership. And the main reason has always been less leadership potential. And that takes us actually to a number of other, it opens up a number of other challenges that I believe are all very related to each other. So when we're saying that women are deprived from these opportunities under the, the reason that they have less leadership potential, it takes us to why do we see that women have less leadership potential? First, it's a stereotype. It's a, it's a heritage of um, miscon miss, uh, uh, connotations between women being in leadership roles the fact that they have to act as men, they have the fact that assertiveness is more connected to males in general than females. And unfortunately, that stereotype is not only existence in the brains of uh, or the subconscious of males, it's also it's still even built in the subconscious of females that if I want to be in a leadership role, I need to act like a man, I need to dress like a man, I need to, to behave like a man, I need to work all the extra hours and not worry about anything because I need to, to step up. I need to actually copy and shadow exactly what my male counterparties are doing. And that actually, unfortunately, deprives women from the main value they add to leadership roles, which is actually bringing that empathy to senior uh, management, bringing that uh, smart social, uh, the social intelligence that females by all studies tend to have as higher than males. And when we're expecting that, when women expect that they need to behave in a certain way, that brings more and more stress and, um, and let's say that forces them to, to, to act in a certain way that just doesn't go with their nature. So also a lot of studies that are done by delivery, uh, by Diversity Q, which is known for, for running these kind of studies around diversity and its impact and opportunities for minorities in workplace. When they have asked females to voice out some of the pressures they feel when they want to pursue senior jobs, one of them has been put forward as we, need, we are always expected to find the balance between being liked and being respected, while our male counterparties don't necessarily ha have that pressure to continue being liked in, er in order to be put in a leadership role. The subconscious um, um, uh, behavior is actually pushing females to feel that in order for me to deserve a role in a leadership role, I have to be respected, but I have to continue being liked because I cannot show that assertiveness. I cannot gain respect without that kind of uh, social acceptance across and, and being someone that everybody would vote for to become less controversial when I'm in the leadership role. Uh, I'm adding to that the other standard um, uh, challenges like, like pay, uh, pay, uh, pay uh, disparity between males and females, despite how much we're, companies are trying to enhance that. It's been frowned upon by every um, uh, law, by, by every society, by the society in general. It's still women are earning an average from eight up to 35 uh, percent less than male counterparties and that brings a lot of uh, demotivation to females when they are promoted to roles and they feel that despite the fact that I'm putting the exact same if not more effort I will still continue to be earning less than my male uh, a male executive in a senior role. Um, ideally the last challenge I would have to say is that lack of opportunity for development mentorship and coaching and again in many studies females have voiced out a concern about leadership and mentorship and, and, and coaching opportunities being made available, more available, easily sponsored for males uh, than females when they want to pursue a leadership role, which by nature requires a lot of coaching and mentorship. All of these challenges alongside the cultural barriers are actually making women participation or success in leadership role a, a much harder track to pursue than males. Thank you, Bara. Yeah, I think I mean, you really hit quite uh, quite a few, you know, solid points that I'm pretty sure everyone here can relate to. Um, you know, especially when you talk about uh, things like likability um, and, and women. You know, we have that that innate, uh, you know, desire to please, right? And I think that you know, especially in Arab society, it's um, it's almost like it's it's 
instilled from a very young age. And so how do you then create that likability yet be assertive yet that unconscious bias that exists makes it difficult then to win anything over. So it's, it's, you know, the perceptions, it's almost like a lose-lose situation. And so it becomes very difficult to navigate. And I think, you know, that's something, uh, you know, that, that women uh, definitely face. Um, and so what would your advice then be for overcoming these types of issues? Um, I think there are multiple ways that can be done, and it's what, what the world has been actually uh, focusing on. So there are things that could be done actually uh, in a forced approach. So there are a lot of things that governments and, and laws can be put in place to support that. So uh, and I, I think there are a lot of good examples here that we can mention. So for instance, when the Vision 2030 was actually created in KSA and uh, followed by the National Transformation Project, there has been clear mandates to increase women participation in leadership role. It's been a mandate, it's been an OKR and a KPI that every vision realization office in every governmental entity or semi-governmental uh, entity that has been created is actually monitoring forcing and uh, and um, penalizing against and while that sounds maybe a, a more of a harsh approach i think some uh, situations need this kind of harsh measures to 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 eventually give that opportunity and and force some regulations that could at least get that uh, female's voice out uh, well heard and then eventually when they are in these positions and we are given these opportunities and they are learning and they're growing eventually this they will be able to prove their worth and their ability to, to handle much more than the stereotype that we have in mind. Uh, and, and it's been managed in a very uh, exciting way. So, and sometimes it's been laws that has been forced by government to have certain level, level of female participation, Saudization and all of that. But also it's been in a reward concept. So there are a lot of encouraging laws that has been put there. So if you hire uh, a Saudi female in a certain role, in a certain leadership role, uh, you are actually rewarded also by providing you with more flexibility to hire for other from other nationalities to hire to to, to actually be able to to get uh, people from outside KSA. This kind of encouraging forcing approach has been very successful. But also, there's a lot of work that has to be done uh, in terms of awareness building and and uh, and uh, and actually just changing that stereotypes. It's not about uh, companies need to to put diversity and inclusion at the center of their. Uh, people and cultural practices. It needs to be uh, um, uh, poli in a policy. It needs to be reflected in every um, uh, touch point in the employee life cycle. When we hire, when we fire, when we promote, the uh, the aspect of putting diversity and female diversity as an element when we make decisions need to be there. Education is very key. So if you come and, and ask many people, do you really make any uh, decisions based on gender in hiring or promoting? The natural position, uh, answer would be no. But if you go and, and actually start challenging that and start putting facts and start building awareness about the importance of having uh, females and it's not just about another box that we need to take it's about actually females in business and in leadership role have proven to be uh, having direct impact on the bottom line it's, it's increasing empathy it's increasing uh, team collaboration and it's eventually making um, a bottom line uh, positive impact it's increasing dollar uh, value so these kind of awarenesses and bringing putting, uh, you know, challenging these uh, things, uh, creating awareness internally, building the reason why we are advocating for women. It's not just about following policies. It's about the value that women bring is very important. And of course, um, uh, putting it as part of policies. So uh, addressing pay inequity across the board, that's very important. And it should be always pay based on, on uh, compensable factors. And it's not ever relevant to, to uh, to gender and having this audit functions and those this uh, practices being audited and policies put in place to kind of make sure we protect as much as we can protect we control as much as pro as we control until the, the education and the awareness is, a, is the natural uh, way to go after that thank you para yeah i think you know that's you know that's really insightful in terms of what can be done within organizations. And I'd like to tap in a little bit further on your experience uh, since you lead Foodix Talents Acquisition um, and you're constantly on the lookout for, you know, amazing new team members. So, you know, let's let's look externally for a moment. And, and what are you seeing in, in the market in terms of women that are seeking work? Have you noticed a significant difference in recent years in terms of the amount of women that are seeking work, their skills, their ambitions, you know, before even entering just from, uh, you know, a recruitment perspective? 
Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I'm not going to go back in time a lot. I'm, I'm going to talk about the last two to three years when we've been heavily engaged in, in recruitment and actually in, um, and we have, we use uh, uh, technologies to help us actually track applicants and, and create some studies around uh, females, uh, any kind of analytics that we want to create that could help us just see the type of people that we attract in jobs. And I can tell you, um, I'm not going to talk about just numbers of females applicants because we've noticed a, a huge shift in number of females applying to different kinds of roles. But what was always catch, what started to catch my attention a lot is that there are roles when we were actually opening, we were very uh, worried that we're not going to be able to attract females to them because it includes some certain kind of hardship. It includes extra working hours, and not extra working hours, actually difficult working hours, especially if it is, has to do with call center services, with managing shifts. It includes hardship when it comes to being available in shops or requiring traveling and being available in multiple locations. So we were not expecting actually a lot of females to be applying. And because we've hired a lot of these roles lately, I'm very, I feel very proud to say that a lot of these positions and leadership positions have been actually filled by females who have put themselves forward and showed interest and, and by merit has been proven to be the most successful candidates for roles. Examples that I can give is that, for instance, we have we have roles that has to do with managing operations and multiple governorates in a certain region, a central region, eastern region, Saudi Arabia. And that means there are uh, offices in this uh, different location. It requires someone to be hands on constantly available, traveling between governorates, being able, able to visit this location constantly. And two out of four positions that we had actually has been filled by females who's been 100% selected, hired, and uh, and uh, and um, uh, sel primarily selected based on merit first and foremost, and they're doing, mashallah, great in their jobs. They are they are doing that extra work, they're, they're traveling, they're making themselves available. I was not expecting that we will be able to hire females in these roles. I, I know that comes with a lot of hardship, but again, females applied and they've been uh, uh, some of the top candidates that you have seen and they are doing great in the job. And that takes me back also to the fact that the changes that Division 2030 has done actually made females be able to reach their full potential. So, so when we have uh, now, we are able to drive for the past three, four years, as simple as this change has been, it allowed females to accept taking jobs that earlier it would have been impossible for them to accept because they need um, someone to take them from places, they need a driver, they need a setup. The, the ease for them to travel, the ease for them to, to pursue learning opportunities, all of these kind of um, uh, limitations that have been taken out truly has helped female reach their full potential. And just taking these limits and allow, allow them to truly fly with full wings and, and not find any complications uh, or unrealistic limits to how they can be successful in jobs that in the past, I used to feel there is no way we could hire a female here because that they are not interested in that role. The number of females who reached me personally as a female in talent acquisition and say, we're interested in Foodix, we're interested in being part of a big dream, we're interested to be partners in this company, uh, I can say that uh, I've been astonished by the, the number of females that have actually showed interest in the company in roles. Again, in the past, I never expected to meet females to be hired. And gladly, I'm saying that in operational roles where I believe most hardship happens, Infodix, we have almost 50-50% distribution between males and females. And again, it's been very organic. It's been based in merit. So I take pride in that, actually. Nice. And when, and when you talk about opportunities, just, you know, since you're working at a leading startup in Saudi, can you tell us your impression of opportunities uh, that women would have there or other startups? And do you think that startups have different types of opportunities or even challenges for women versus more established organizations? Uh, I would like to look at the boss of sites and say they have much more opportunities in startups as of now. And the reason why is that when you are a startup, you still have this agile uh, method and that kind of room that you protect very well, which is the room of flexibility, the room of being able to try things out and experiment with models that has not been experimented. And it's easier to experiment with it because we're still not fully driven by governance and by policies and procedures. We are still having that flexibility to do things in a different way. I like here to give an example of reflecting on my own hiring in Fudix. And, and the reason I like to share this per story because it's very personal, but it for me proved to be the, uh, very successful and I've been trying to to make that experience the, the same for many females. When I was hired in Fudix, I was 
still uh, actually I was pregnant in my third trimester, uh, eight weeks away from delivering my third boy. Um, and uh, I was hired for a role where um, I was actually uh, asked by the two gentlemen that I, I sent many regards to, they have asked me what could we do to make that role attractive for you? And that was one of the first times I was asked this question, like what can we do in the type of the role that we craft for you, the, 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 the flexibility that you need so we can make you successful in this role because we understand that you're a female, uh, you're a mom, uh, you're pregnant already, you're gonna need your maternity leave soon. So what can we do to make the job environment more welcoming? And I made a very, um, I took a leap of faith and I said, I'd like to work remotely for as long as I can. And I know that I can make it happen. And I didn't expect a callback. I thought they're gonna say, this is too, she's too crippled. She's pushing her limits far too much. So we can do that. And I got a call back immediately. And I said like, you're gonna be the first remote hire in Foodix. You're gonna be working from home as long as you make that job successful. And um, we're gonna experiment with that. We have the luxury to experiment. We have the opportunity to experiment. And if you can do this and you know that you can do this, we'll be more than happy to make that a standard in our hiring. We are a flexible hybrid model. If you can make it happen, we can use this as a case to promote that even more. And that impact on me as a female being hired in a leadership role, accepting to be hired remotely with full flexibility, purely measured by performance, not by click in, click out, which I think is something harder to be implemented in bigger corporates as of now, had a, a huge impact on my motivation, loyalty, desire to achieve far and beyond than my job description, my, my, my role. And this is something that we have then on board level accepted to introduce. We are a hybrid model. Whenever the, the, the job uh, accepts that and promotes that, we're gonna allow hybrid model as a remote model as a standard hiring uh, um, uh, uh, contract in Foodex. It's a standard uh, setup, as long as results are being achieved. These type of experiments, these types of trials, these types of taking very challenging approaches, new innovative approach to things, I think that's what startups can provide. And it's a little bit less uh, other big companies where there are a lot of governance and unions and things like that. It's harder. Um, on the other side, I think in bigger companies, females will have especially females who are looking for much more fixed life work balance with certain relatively increased benefits, they would be more interested in uh, an eight to five fixed role. Startups will give you more of a life work, uh, life work integration where you can just get your results done as long as you find whatever formula that works for you. So uh, startups are a great place for females uh, as long as they provide these kind of flexibilities and uh, options. Thank you, Barat. That's an amazing story, to be honest. And I think, you know, sharing, you know, that type of an interview definitely is something rare, um, but it does definitely show the power um, that, that startups do have in that agility and flexibility to at least trial these types of uh, components, um, which may not always be in the larger corporates. And so that's that's an amazing story. And I think Graves gives great context and I think is is kind of inspiring, I think from an organizational pr perspective that, you know, people can consider being more flexible in the way they hire, the questions they ask. Um, and when you have suitable candidates, how you can create flexibility and in giving, you end up receiving even more. So, so thanks for sharing that. I think that's a great example. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to actually turn over to Hannah a bit um, to kind of just shift gears on, you know, that entrepreneurship focus to talk a little bit more about education within the kingdom. And so, Hannah, you know, you're an expert on education reform in Saudi Arabia. And education, of course, has a huge impact on society and culture. Um, and you've spoken in the past about how the government is working to promoting a narrative of grit and resilience with young people. How do you think that's going and what changes have you seen in terms of how Saudi uh, approaches education, particularly with regard to women? Um, and what do you see as the remaining issues with the education system that still need to be addressed to boost women's workforce participation, women's entrepreneurship, and, and the women's ability to rise um, into business leadership roles? Yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned the um, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor studies before, and I'll, I'll go back to that a little bit. I think as a country in the region, we are 
ahead in terms of kind of entrepreneurial support, um, in terms of policies, in terms of, uh, you know, even the risk taking, but especially in terms of financial support. But the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor also highlights kind of that the key challenge that remains with entrepreneurship, uh, for example, is education, that the right skills aren't fostered, especially not early enough. And so it's been, you know, a couple, uh, several years since we've been talking about the importance of 21st century skills, you know, teamwork, um, uh, critical thinking, all of the, the, the different things that you would expect somebody that is working in the 21st century would need. And I think that the problem is grit and resilience is very important, but an enabling ecosystem is essential for people to be able to practice that. We need to learn how to respond to setbacks and, and be resilient. However, we also need to ensure that there are pathways and routes for everyone to be able to access the type of education and training that's going to foster those skills. I think there are shifts, but also the, the, the quality of implementation from what I can see is uneven. You have an acknowledgement of the importance of certain skills, but a lack of expertise on how to deliver those and how to train people on how to use them. Um, and how they're how they're taught really, and and that it does vary depending on what kind of resources you have. Certain schools, especially ones that are you pay high fees to go to, may do that better than other schools. Even if the Ministry of Education is investing heavily in doing this, the teachers might not know exactly how to deliver this. So there's going to need to be a lot of investment in the way teachers are trained to do this with young people all the way through. So I think. We can move the needle quite sharply and actually very quickly with two quick interventions in my point of view. The first would be to institutionalize real career guidance in schools from an early age. And this isn't just a career fair or these are the jobs of the future or what do you wanna be when you grow up? This begins with self-exploration, it begins with self-realization and it goes on to build proper research negotiation skills, which would ideally be linked to realistic opportunities in education and training um, and jobs in the future as well. So that needs to happen and we need to do that well and we need to do that with trained professionals for everybody, all students in the kingdom. And then the second thing is to do more on the 21st century skills. So, you know, teamwork, innovation, these aren't taught in textbooks. You can never teach somebody critical thinking by reading what it means. It has to be done through practice. So I believe we need more extracurricular activities in schools, sports, debate, chess, music, public speaking. I'd love to see this be part and parcel of our curriculum and every school needs to have that. And if they lack the expertise and the teachers are in the process of reskilling, there could be partnerships with some of the amazing institutions within our kingdom that are doing great things. So there's phenomenal progress with sports. That needs to be inside schools on a daily basis with all students as well. There's phenomenal progress in arts and culture. All of this exists, but we should not see it as separate to the education system. We can work together in order to provide those things. And once you have those skills, that turns into excellence. It, it doesn't turn you into a doctor, a lawyer. It turns you into the best version of yourself who will be the best lawyer, doctor, executive, or whatever it is. You do need to be trained early on in thinking differently about these things. And I think that there's potential to really do that, but I think we still have work to do. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. And as a mom of two little boys, um, you know, I see that every day. And, and sometimes I think, you know, I think the school thinks my kids supposedly go to a really tough school and sometimes I think they think that I'm the tougher mom. I think they, they're a little concerned and I'm like, it'll pay off one day. And so, you know, I can see the importance, especially when it comes to grit and resilience and, and how teaching those skills at an early age makes a longer term impact. Um, so thank you for, you know, sharing those insights. Um, you know, in your work, additionally, you've written about the importance of WASTA for Saudi women. Right. Uh, and so grit and resilience is one component, but having WASTA is another completely. For those who are unaware, WASTA in Arabic it means middleman or a connection per se. Uh, do you think that women uh, lack strong female WASTAs in the business realm who want to start a company or rise to leadership roles um, and that they'll face significant challenges if they don't? 
Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think despite the growth of women in decision-making positions, there are still more men in those positions. That's creating obstacles. It's the implicit bias that Bharat talked about, but it's also just the fact that they hang out together. And so when you're thinking, I mean, we, we need to be each other's wastas for a while before there's more opportunities to really connect with men and women on professional levels. I'd love to say that we don't need someone to step in and help us achieve our goals, but I think the truth of the matter is you can call it what you want, but you need a support network that's going to prioritize your success, right? So men and women still socialize separately despite these social shifts, and therefore women are probably going to miss out on opportunities to really showcase their strengths, what they know, their ambitions with key decision makers. And I'd love to see more professional networks. So I'm part of some, but I would like to see more. And, and women in that way can support one another, but then also the networks can enable men and women to professionally learn about one another. So I've seen a lot of progress in the way women present themselves on social media, like LinkedIn. More of that can help, you know, participating in more public events where you can make a professional impression um, is another thing that women should do, because then maybe you'll be considered for a board position or a managerial position, because people then know you, because you're not going to be hanging out with your friends who most likely would be able to help you get that role. Um, I think one of my favorite, and I'm just going to keep this brief, but one of my favorite quotes that I've seen circulating quite a bit this year and in the past is, you know, surround yourself with women who would mention your name in a room full of opportunities. We do need each other. And until we have men that want to give those opportunities to us more, we need to do it for each other at the moment. Totally. That's uh, I think, you know, I've seen that quote floating around too. And I think that's a really powerful statement, right? There's, you know, those, those people that you enjoy the company of, but then those who will also support you and help you and, and name dropping does go a long way. And, and I mean, it does go with that wasta as well. It's, it's about how you socialize those business relationships. Um, and in a podcast interview a few years ago, you also spoke about the opportunities for women in the semi-informal economy, such as on Instagram. Can you share what you're seeing in terms of women creating businesses online or using technology to reach customers? Is this becoming more widespread? Um, I think that possibly we're moving past that. You know, I think that maybe that's where a lot of women found their kind of in into the labor market. And, and there was a lot of more participation in kind of that, that Instagram space where you could create things and sell them. Um, but I think that women are actually kind of jumping on opportunities to work outside the home in, you know, kind of uh, bigger organizations or to start their own, um, you know, kind of organizations. So I think there's still space for women who do face obstacles. And I mean, sorry, I've just, I was looking at some of the questions that were uh, posed online and that's related to this in, in the sense where there are women that still have trouble accessing transportation, that still have trouble accessing, um, child support. And I think that this is a way where women still can find a really valid and reasonable workaround for that. And there is there is income that's involved in that. So I think that it's still, a, still an important part of the economy for a lot of women. Uh, it helps if you don't have a family that would support you mixing genders in the workplace. It helps if you have, struggle to balance your kind of home uh, responsibilities as well as your work responsibilities because you can do a lot of this from home or when your children are sleeping or in school. I think that it's it's definitely still something that's really, really helpful. But I do think that more women are entering the formal economy and there are support programs that are increasing to help women enter the formal economy in different ways from all socioeconomic um, kind of uh, levels. There are definitely challenges. I mean, this is all changing really fast. I don't have numbers to back whether what the informal economy looks like in terms of women on using social media, but for, you know, for commercial enterprises and so on. But I do think that, you know, technology is a space where women are actually leading at the moment anyways. And so I feel like that speaks volumes. Maybe you started there, but now you're starting a slightly larger company or employing more people and you're growing in that way. And so I think that it's, it's definitely been the catalyst for a lot of women uh, to get into the labor market. Yeah, thanks. I think, you know, that's really valid. And, and and I think that when we think about, you know, women and work, it's, you know, we think always like larger scale organizations and, and even startups, you know, often you see, you know, 
companies like Foodix that are flashing in front of you, which have become quite successful and, 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 you know, small startups that start on Instagram are, you know, whether that's a place to stay, at least it's an option, um, but it's also a starting point. And then that's really powerful. And then and that could involve, of course, into, you know, um, whether it's a larger scale organization or fulfill a need in and of its time, um, which may be enough. And I think having options is, is critical. Um, so thank you, Hannah. Um, and I'd like to actually turn over to Zina now to actually take a more corporate perspective. You know, I think, you know, we, we evolved from like, you know, the, the entrepreneurship, the foodix perspective, um, you know, even talking about, you know, smaller Instagram type uh, businesses. Um, Zina, you're an expert in implementing diversity in the workplace, um, and of course, large scales organizations like PwC. And uh, in, you spoke in 2019 at the Women's Economic Empowerment Global Summit about diversity in business leadership. And you also recently collaborated with NEMA Women Advance Advancement Establishment to share PwC Middle East's journey to promoting gender diversity. What have you learned from your career about the best practices to promote gender inclusivity in workplaces? Sure, so uh, thanks Jamila. L let me start by highlighting key facts. So diversity in the workplace can and does drive financial performance. I think my colleagues and, and panelists uh, mentioned this already, but I can't say this enough and I've seen it firsthand. Boosting the number of women in, in work is not just a moral imperative. It's no longer just you know a nice to have, it's a must have. Um, creating an inclusive workplace uh, improves the performance and is the right thing to do. Um, if you take a work survey, 2022, young women, powerful, ambitious, um, it clearly says increased female employment could increase GDP across the MENA region by 57%. Um, and these are facts. Let me share with you some best practices that I've seen quite honestly at PwC and elsewhere that, that really help us drive the IND agenda. Um, first, having access to the right mentor or sponsor throughout your career is crucial, personal and professional uh, uh, step. Uh, they both play uh, separate yet equal important roles in supporting growth uh, and, and moving you to the next level. Mentors help you grow personally and professionally and sponsors open doors to help you uh, get ahead. And I think Hannah, touched on this already in terms of, you know, the importance of being allies of each other, finding the right people, um, uh, mentioning your voice in a room full of opportunities. So that's the role of the, the, the role of, of ally, the role of a sponsor and a mentor it depends on, on the hat that they're wearing. Um, when looking for a sponsor, think about opportunities and, and the opportunities that they can give you and the doors that they can open for you. Um, again, some stats for you. Uh, women have an average of two sponsors throughout their careers, where men have six. Be bold enough to ask someone to be your sponsor or mentor um, and, and think about what do you want to get out of the relationship. On a personal level, and I'm inspired by Bara and, and she shared her story, um, I took ownership of my career very early on and made sure that I have access to the right mentors and sponsor uh, sponsors on a, on a personal and professional levels. This helped me navigate many barriers. My first job was in the States. Uh, I was fresh out of the boat Iraqi, and uh, I had and I worked for a big firm, a multinational firm, and and I needed access to mentors, sponsors to help me navigate all these uh, barriers. And I have to say, and 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 my story is similar to Bara. I was lucky enough to work with the right organization back then, um, and that was back in 2002. I was fresh graduate back then, and and quite honestly. When I ask if I can ask work remotely certain days because I was working on my uh, LLM uh, in the States, um, my boss told me, I don't care where you work from as long as you get the job done. And that was the first time I hear something about flexibility. And uh, now this is now integrated in, in policies and, and, and IND policies across the region. So that's the first thing, best practice. The second thing, and actually I think my colleagues touched on it as well, the importance of having the right policies and procedures specifically to working mothers. Um, we are currently looking at something called returnship. 
And I know there are some flagship programs out there um, uh, on how can we support returning moms from their leaves. So according to our research, 85% of uh, our uh, the, the survey that we've I've mentioned earlier, um, respondents say returnship programs are on the top of their uh, agendas. And they would like, and this a pro, having a program like this will encourage them to get back to work from a career break by easing the transition back to work through networking opportunities uh, and skill support. Returnship can also help women regain their confidence and professional self-belief. Um, many of our women uh, in work, Mina survey respondent, feared that they would return to lower paid roles after maternity leave, a phenomenon referred to as the motherhood penalty. The corporate world can also support women throughout their career life cycle, including women who go on career breaks and want to, to return to work. And, and these are some of the, the programs that I've highlighted. Thank you, Zina. I can. I mean, that's that's amazing that you guys have the returnship program because I think that is a critical point that I think a lot of organizations do tend to overlook. Um, and what are the obstacles that women do face? It's not just about coming in and building, but then having to take that break and then coming back. Right. That does impact again whether that sense of confidence or those that gap of skills that you know you lose over that time whatever it may be i think that's that's a really impressive program and, and great to hear um i think sometimes we think of these programs as well um in terms of always being productive and often they can be new types of programs is there anything that you've seen over time uh practices that were initiated that have actually been counterproductive very good question, Jamila. And, and I have to be honest and transparent here. One of the common mistakes that I've seen uh, is driving the gender agenda without paying attention to the qualification, experience, skill set, and all of that. When you promote women or admit them to the boards based on gender only, women will feel that they're part of a quota and men will perceive this as bias. Driving gender bias is important, yes, but it has to be linked to a business imperative, making sure that you bring the experience, skill set, and, 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 and uh, uh, knowledge into the equation. You don't look at it from just the gender lens. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point of view. And I think sometimes even with that, we don't consider that it could backfire for other women who are looking to rise. And then, you know, it's when that opportunity opportunity is given, um, if a suitable candidate or if a candidate is not suitable for that role, then, then you know, there's already an unconscious bias and that's only going to fuel it even further. And so that could be not just counterproductive for that individual, but for, you know, other potential women that, you know, could be reaching those roles as well. So, so thank you so much, Zina. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to turn over to, to May and focus on your organization, the Arab Institute for Women's Empowerment, um, NUS. So they're working, or you guys are working, to advancing the kingdom's national development agenda and Vision 2030. Um, the, the agenda of increasing women's participation in the workforce. What action is NUSF taking to help achieve this change? And what do you see as the biggest issue that needs to be addressed? Um, thank you, Jamila. Uh, absolutely. And I want to build on what Dr. Hanat mentioned on the education. Um, women, there's been a lot of investment in women's education. Um, women in Saudi Arabia are ranked number one in education in the MENA region. They're also ranked 10th globally. Um, the, the amount of investment done for men and women is they even provide stipends for you when you get into college just to ensure that you don't drop off to go and support your family. And then there's a scholarship program where only second to um, China in, in that area. So there's huge a huge budget that's dedicated for, um, for Saudis. And, and so putting all of that together, yet the unemployment rate among women is still one of the highest so i you, you kind of see a disconnect how could you be so educated and how could you be so unemployed so we realized 
that, okay, the country has done its part and invested in all of them, but there is a part that we need to look at and that's the society. So in, in our program, LUSC, we built our pillars around, uh, we, we built it on three areas. Equip, that's the training arm, a research, of course, means research, and then uh, the connect, this is our CSR arm where we focus on the society. And so, um, for instance, uh, the uh, equip pillar uh, provides women, um, the, uh, there are three levels. Uh, the first level provides women with soft skills. Believe it or not, since women are so educated, the majority of them, not the majority, a, a large number of them have technical degrees, petroleum engineers, nanotechnologists, doctors, scientists, and so forth, yet they're not very assertive. They're not outspoken. Uh, they're kind of reserved because that goes back to us as children where we were raised as young girls and boys, where the boy would go to the shop with his father. And that's where he learns all the important skills on negotiation and so forth. And girls, we as we grew up as little girls, we were taught to be shy, reserved, uh, soft-spoken, you don't get into arguments and stuff like that. So we grow up um, not being very assertive and shy. And so, but we're so smart, but it doesn't show. And so we want to tell them that these important soft skills like personal branding, like negotiation, like emotional intelligence, and, and being assertive does not contradict with your values. In fact, it complements it. So, so, when, so with that in our Connect Pillar, we focus on uh, four initiatives. The first initiative um, is, uh, the first initiative is NUS Voices. This is a podcast that we have conversations with the society. It's a monthly podcast, but every time we uh, alternate men and women, we talk about the taboos. We talk about our setbacks. We talk about the challenges, us as a society. And we don't claim, by the way, to have any answers, but just by putting it out there, once you acknowledge it, this is where the shift happens. So we try to focus on that. And we also want to celebrate the men who support the women in that society. I feel like they're kind of invisible or shy or don't stand out. So we need to showcase them. And, and then um, talking about uh, mentorship, you know, I, I worked in Aramco for 30 years. I was never mentored. I never had a male mentor. I never had a female mentor. That word mentorship didn't exist by, back then. And so we had to navigate in treacherous waters and, and it was difficult, but now it is so essential. And since I mentored many, many young women when I was in Aramco, this, this, this setting was very formal and it takes maybe 10 minutes for a young lady to feel comfortable, to ask questions and so forth. So we created the walk the talk. This is a mentorship program that um, we identified, well, last year we identified 30 senior executive women and matched them by 30 young professional women. Since I live in Khobar, on the Kurdish, we gathered there and we told them you have an hour and a half to walk one-on-one -on -one together. And they came back after an hour and a half excited. Um, the, the young ladies were excited. The senior executive said, now we, we didn't know how to give back. And thank you for giving us this opportunity. We want to be able to share these experiences. And in addition to that, we get to walk. So that's good exercise for us. So all of this is working to break down the social barriers that are getting in the way of women's advancement by having these conversations. And then we have another one, which is uh, the monthly leadership talk, where we talk with uh, men and women on what we can do to move that economic needle so uh, women can be participating in the economy. Um, Saudi Arabia was the host of the G20 um, two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. And um, they produced a report that said investing in targeted training for Saudi women will generate a $400 billion uh, investment return on investment 
to the country's GDP by 2030. So for that, we have created another event. It's called SWIFT, Saudi Women Economic Forum. This, this Saudi Women Economic Forum, we want it to be just as big as WIF, the World Economic Forum, only for women's economy in Saudi Arabia. This is where we get to discuss the $400 billion on how do we catch or capture these low hanging fruits how do we invest further in women and raise the, co the country's economy, have women participating and, and get that also get that um, uh, equity going on and, and hopefully that will gain. Um, and so in a nutshell, this is what we try to do because we realize that women cannot advance without the support of the society. That could be men, of course, men, he's her boss. He's the one who's gonna give her the promotion. He's the one who's gonna support her, just like our guests had talked about, they had great bosses. He's the father who, who supported her throughout her um, college time and then uh, and after she got married. And he's the husband. He's the brother, he's the son. So they are essential in our society, that kind of support, and we need it. I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for my father's support back then, my husband and my brothers. And we look for it, we want it. We want to have them support us. And, and also, I have to say, as a society, we're very close knitly, closely connected with our extended family. Our grandmothers have a say, our aunts are, are, and so all of that is the society that we want to have that conversation to bring down the impediments that get in the way uh, of women's advancement. And, and I guess that's, that's, that's uh, explains it in a nutshell. Thank you, May. Those are, I mean, that's a lot of great initiatives that you guys have going on. I mean, I think, you know, reiterating that 400 billion ROI, it's not, it's not bad. A lot of money. Not bad exactly. It's not a bad figure. And I think, if, you know, sometimes, especially people that think just financially right away, I mean, that number right there alone is something to, to, to really bear in mind. Um, and, and just to take you know, back to your experience with Aramco, because this is, you know, I know it's your baby now, and you've had this great long career also in Aramco. You know, during your time there, did you witness any key changes regarding gender inclus inclusivity uh, while you were there at that time? Um, what I what I witnessed was a lot of waves. Um, Aramco, just like um, other Arab, well, Aramco is a company, just like Saudi Arabia, just like other Arab countries in the region, went through different waves. And um, uh, one of the waves that we went through was a wave of decline in the 80s and uh, 90s, where there was um, uh, women were not recognized. And instead of, instead of, um, uh, and I'll, why, why would I generalize? Let me just give you an example. Um, of myself. Um, we had just inaugurated the company's uh, new brand, the Aramco logo, and it was set in a beautiful open space for Aramco employees to attend and the CEOs and so forth. And so me and my female colleagues were really excited. We went early to find good seats. And a few days later, it was posted in the company's uh, paper and we were looking for ourselves. And then all of a sudden we couldn't find ourselves. We were erased and replaced by uh, a picture of a man. And it was almost like find Aldo. It was the same man where every woman was seated. And while we started to laugh, it was actually very, very sad. And I would say that this is one of the times where it, it um, the time where there was that decline. And of course, just like uh, Saudi Arabia has risen again, Aramco itself is also doing, and they're catching up on lost time. And they've established a lot of um, key performance indicators on how much they want to do for women. And uh, they, they've positioned themselves that they wanna go forward with that. Yet, as an energy company, we still have very low rates of women participation and there needs to be done more. And there needs to be more women in leadership positions, where, whatever company it is. 
So I would say that the kingdom is way more progressive than Aramco today and back then. That's amazing. And that's amazing to see again, just how far the government has come so quickly, um, just in the last five years alone, um, for, you know, to say that, you know, organizations like Aramco, which have always been, you know, you know, revered as, as the exemplary organizations and like leaders uh, in such kind of initiatives uh, and programs uh, to now make a statement that, you know, the government is even more so progressive. I think that's a really yes. powerful statement um, to where the country has evolved to today. And, um, and I think, you know, there's a lot more to come still. I know that that bar is raising higher and higher. Um, and so thanks for sharing those insights. And I think, you know, you you also mentioned those waves that, you know, Aramco has gone through. And I think, you know, lots of organizations um, and, and societies go through that as well. And I often call it the pendulum, right, where, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of motion on one uh, idea, one movement, um, and it goes to an extreme even, and then it has to just kind of swing back and before it finds its sense of balance. And I think, kind of, you mentioned yeah. earlier, you talked about balance quite a bit. And I think that that's, you know, really a critical component. But to get to that, that you know, there always has to be either, again, those waves or that pendulum shifting from side to side. Um, so thank you guys so much. I think that these, there's been a lot of great insights um, from, you know, from perspectives of entrepreneurship, whether in the market or within organizations from large scale organizations to startups, um, you know, across the board. Um, it's been great hearing from you guys. Uh, I wanna open the floor just for you guys to give just any kind of a closing statement. I think any recommendation that you could give um, to an individual and to organizations, one piece of advice uh, as a final note, and then we can open up the floor for some questions. Uh, we can start over with May. Um, I would say that we owe it to this country to reinvest uh, in it um, with the level of education that we have. And if you don't, with your small startup, hire people, get involved, be part of that. It's an exciting time to be a Saudi woman. Thank you, May. Zina? You're on mute, Zina. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, I would like to say that I'm very proud of all Saudi women and all Arab women, to be honest. Uh, we're making huge strides. We just have to take it easy on ourselves and, and move the needle one step at a time and have our voice heard. Thank you, Zina. Hannah? There's so many things. I don't know. I was trying to trying to pick <laughs> one. Um, I think I think actually just because I felt like when both Bera and Zina were talking about their experiences of having um, support, and then May brought it up as well. I think we really do need to celebrate the people who support us throughout this process and the people that have been. So I'm really happy that women can drive in Saudi Arabia, but I really owe a lot to the driver that took me everywhere I needed to go for the years of me working. I really owe it to my dad for the rides, my brother for the rides, and all of the men that did give me a chance and took a chance on me when I was hired into different positions. My husband being kind of the core of that, but also in thinking of my career, um, working with Rabi Holding and Sheikh Abdelaziz of Turkey, I just want to shout out to him and that organization being incredibly, in incredibly um, accommodating for women. So be do better. <laughs> for women across uh, all parts of your life, you know, whether it's a family member or somebody in your organization. Thanks, Anna. That's a good point, right? I think that sometimes we overlook that, you know, when we didn't have those opportunities, who was it that was really there for us? Thanks. But, uh, um, a simple conclusion, actually, uh, I'd like to thank uh, every lady who's been participating in this uh, enriching uh, conversation, honestly. Uh, I think just to say, um, stating the obvious uh, that our uh, empowerment as uh, females leaders and in jobs uh, will should not and uh, should not be something that concerns us about being also playing the one of the most important roles in our lives which is being women in our families being moms being sisters being uh, just the females that, that we are who bring the, the, the beautiful empathetic uh, touch uh, to, to the lives of people around us so uh, there has been a lot of misconception about the fact that if i want to be successful i need to sacrifice a lot i need to to to, to, to put my family second 
at a stage. Uh, I do believe and I think and I see myself and many, many of the females who work in Fodix as life examples that with the, choosing to work in the right place with the right people, speaking up, working hard on yourself, educating yourself, getting the right mentorship and support, speak up. And you can have it all. Honestly, you can be the mom you want. You can be the, 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 the wife that you aspire to be. And definitely, definitely you can be a leader in a company and bring value and um, just believe in it. Yani, don't, don't feel that you need to give up one of these roles. It's all important and you can do it all. Thank you so much, Bara. Thank you so much, ladies. Again, from an organizational perspective in terms of talking about programs like the return trip program um, or you know, the agility that startups can offer uh, women to individual traits and recommendations that you guys gave about you know, being assertive and, and the importance of early education and learning about the 21st century. 21st century skills from an early age. I think that you guys have shed some uh, light on some extremely important topics um, across the board and from various angles. Uh, and so thank you so much today. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions uh, for anyone that is on our Zoom call or for anyone who is on the ground in Riyadh. Uh, feel free to either drop a line in the chat box or you can reach out to Nagat in the room. Um, I, I think I can uh, address um, uh, the first question on uh, divorce and family. Can I stand here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay. Can you guys hear me? Uh, okay. yeah. Let me, let me read ahead. it. Uh, there are some accusations and debates about the impact of women, career empowerment, and relocation on families especially increased rate of divorce, postponing marriage and having children, and the consequences of that on society. What do you think? Oh, question to Dr. Hanna. It's for you, Hanna. No, go for it. Well, no, I think it'd be good to have two perspectives. I think May, you know, if you're interested in sharing it, and then Hanna, you can share your perspective as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I would say, um, I would say we right now are comparing um, the past with the present. And the past women didn't have that much enablement. They were not financially independent. Um, they didn't have a lot of choices. So many of them were stuck in marriages with children, true, but um, maybe they didn't have as many options as they do today where they are. Um, they feel like they want to control their career. They want to have a say in what their future is going to look like. And they choose to explore all of that before starting a family. So that creates the delay in, in that. And so, and to make sure that she the idea is not to just get married. She wants to wait for the right person, have those conversations with that person and see if that's the right fit. So she wants to be on that wheel to, um, to, to control her destiny. I know. Um, no, I, I completely agree with that. And I think that it's a matter of expectations. If, if you are thinking about you know, getting married to a woman for her to be a traditional kind of uh, idea of what a wife is supposed to do. Maybe women today are not going to fulfill that role. So I think that it's a matter of women are not abandoning that role. It's turning into something else. It's evolving into a partnership. It's evolving into a, a, a different kind of um, relationship. If we do go back to breadwinner, caretaker and we keep those two as distinguishable roles within the household, then yes, you're going to have problems when women are going to work. But if you look at it as a partnership where everybody's contributing to the success of the household and you have more of these conversations with 
boys when they're younger and girls when they're younger about what they should expect a family life to look like, then I don't think we're going to have these problems. And if we're facing the problems today, it goes back to one of the things that Bharat said earlier. It's a matter of how people were educated and what they expect. So if we can set the right expectations and have these conversations more openly, you will have a healthier relationship. And I think that a partnership is definitely something you should aspire to rather than a marriage where you have very distinct roles that are, you know, kind of dying out in the way our society is organized today. Thank you. Guys. Thank you, May. Thank you, Hannah. I think, you know, that's a really good point, especially when you talk about identifying, defining gender roles from a younger age, because then that creates that understanding as you evolve and you get older. Uh, so thank you, guys. Uh, we do have another question. Um, can the panelists please speak to how recent policy changes, such as driving or non-gender discriminating, non-gender discrimination in hiring, affects perhaps differently Saudi women from lower socioeconomic classes and migrant women like domestic workers, have these sectors of societies reap the benefits of policy changes to the same extent? And what can be done to ensure all, all women in Saudi benefit equally from such changes? Anyone in particular interested in taking that one? I mean, I've spoken, oh, go ahead, Bera. I, I add, so I will add just a, a very short answer to that because I have to be uh, transparent about the experience that we have, especially in Foodix, because the nature of jobs that we hire for, uh, and, and it's a very spot on question, I have to say, it doesn't, the roles that we hire for doesn't uh, necessarily uh, uh, cater or attract uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, females uh, that has been addressed in this question. So it's a very spot on question. It actually, when I read it in the chat, it made me think about what can we do and, and what can can be done in terms of the changes in the policies and impacting the, the females in these societies. I have to say, though, um, yes, I think driving uh, and traveling will not have the biggest impact, but I want to present um, an observation and maybe ask my other uh, colleagues in the in the session to participate in. Uh, if you go right now to, to any mall in KSA, if you go to, to the shops that send in, in, in the big hypermarkets, I can uh, assure you, and, and you all see that a lot of these positions are filled by females who I assume uh, as well do not necessarily uh, come driving or come from uh, the communities that has that uh, benefit or reap the benefit of the changes of policies. But they are there. They're, they're handling jobs in shops, in hypermarkets, in, in malls. Uh, they're staying there to, to, to manage shops, uh, opening them until 10 p.m. at night. So... I think what I've started to notice is that the shift in these policies were um, started by the females who were able to drive and travel, started to, to, to actually be more active in the workplace, have encouraged the society as a whole to support females pursuing opportunities when the right setup is there. So yes, maybe uh, people from these communities, females from these communities have not necessarily found a difference between when whether they are able to drive or not, because maybe the, the, the mere fact of having a car does not present itself as an opportunity for them. But the fact that they have been seeing a lot of females participating in work environment and a lot of companies putting uh, active strategies and policies to support females find opportunities and jobs and prioritizing females in these roles, uh, have actually encouraged them to speak up, have encouraged them to pursue these opportunities. And then eventually most of these jobs has actually been providing and taking extra step to provide support to these females, like providing uh, transportation allowances, buses, shuttle buses. I've seen a lot of these um, females actually coming in buses and uh, taking from their home, dropped into the malls, do their service and come back. So I give it, I, ha I take hats off actually for, for a lot of the big chains and uh, big companies and hypermarkets who wanted to actually make that possible by going out of their way and providing benefits on top of the normal benefits that they provide, including transportation and things like that to help females who would necessarily not benefit from the change in, 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 the, uh, in the limits that used to be there, but actually providing opportunities and finding solutions to help them pursue these jobs. Thanks, Farah, and I thank you also. 
that hand was really big. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, the kingdom has over 100 programs in terms of social protection. And a lot of these programs are geared specifically at training and upskilling. And they are targeting all segments of society. And these are done through government organizations directly to families that register that they are in need of extra financial support that then is given to them in addition to the employment support and the pre-employment training. In addition to our incredibly vibrant and mostly female-led nonprofit sector within the kingdom that do so many different things for women that may not necessarily find an easy route into the labor market. And I think that, you know, just as one simple example, I've been working recently with an organization on a financial literacy program for women to really, A, make sure that they understand what the purpose of budgeting is, but B, more importantly, is understanding the dangers of debt and how to get out of debt. So not to rely on social protection, but to understand where you can save, where you can actually make changes in your daily budgeting, and then how you can turn that and possibly even your skills into a, a income stream for you and your family. So I think I think it's really important to mention the social protection programs in the kingdom and how incredibly effective they are and how they're growing and shifting now to really try and help people get more skills that then they can use in the labor market. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, that's so true. And I think you know it's important also to to look when we talk about programs and initiatives in terms of segments of society because the skills and the needs are going to be completely different from one to another. Um, very, very enough. All right, we do have a question also from uh, live in Riyadh. If we could get uh, the participant to come to the screen. Uh, hi guys, thank you so much for this great session. And I just want to add that even if we're not in leadership positions, uh, I believe it's a serious uh, responsibility for all women in the work course to, to empower other women and girls, to, to help them, to, uh, to share knowledge with them, to hire the, the, them, to, to support them, and to celebrate their small achievements, not just the big ones. Imagine if we, all, all of us here, help each other and empower each other by listening, just listening to each other's uh, uh, challenges without judging each other. and. Uh, supporting each other, uh, celebrating each other, this will develop a, like, like will add an impact, not just for the society, but for the whole country. And thank you. This is really an inspiring session. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we, we're just gonna take one more question uh, for the sake of time. Um, so we have the question, uh, another question from Ian Teo uh, asking, how can society enable and level up women to take on bigger roles, responsibilities, and even political offices, whether in the public or private workplace? The truth is these all boys clubs still prevail and perhaps is one of the reasons why women are second for most of the time. Should there be a new rules of engagement for hiring and promotions? A very, very good question. And actually, I think the beautiful lady from uh, the Riyadh uh, uh, audience answered uh, uh, this question in a, in a different way. The, creating the community of allyship is important, and that will answer the first bit of the question. Um, society has a role to play, and we all have roles to play. So being allies of each other, creating a community of allies, making sure that you lift and support another lady as you go along uh, and help uh, her by by uh, uh, amplifying her opportunity, uh, you know, skill set and providing her with opportunities. That's one. Second, and that's something that I I can talk to from experience. Having the right program uh, around measurement and accountability. Talking about I and D is great, but unless you have the right programs uh, and KPIs in place, it will be a nice to have. The minute you shift into KPIs and accountabilities and measurement, it will be a must have. And everyone will start listening to you and understanding what you're talking about. So that's what we're doing at PwC. Every single partner across the Middle East is now measured on their IND score. Um, and, and we have 
set of KPIs for them to measure on, and we share with them a quarterly report on how to do that. And that has a direct effect, effect on hiring, retaining, promotion, and all of that, because now they think IND when they start hiring. They think IND when they start promoting and all of that. So having the right accountability uh, and measurement programs in place will help a lot. Thank you so much, Zina. Accountability, powerful powerful word. Um, and with that, we do have to wrap up this fascinating discussion. Thank you all to all, thank you to all of our panelists for being with us here today. And a huge thanks to the US Embassy in Riyadh, PepsiCo and UPS for sponsoring the Win Fellowship and this event. Have a great day to everyone that is attending. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us.